Uh, now we come to the um, research talk session, our responsibility in personalization. Uh, I'm uh, Fang Zhao Wu, a researcher at Microsoft Research Asia, and I'm the host of this uh, session. And uh, um, we all know that uh, AI has been uh, widely used to understand the human ourselves and provide personalized service to us. However, the research on how to understand, how to evaluate, and how to design a trustworthy personalized model is still at the initial stage. In this session, we invite several senior researchers from social science and computer science to share their research advancements in this area. The first talk will be presented by Professor Yongfeng Zhang, and the title is uh, Towards Trustworthy Recommender Systems from Shannon Models to Deep Models to Nudge Models. Uh, professor Yongfeng Zhang is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rutgers University. His research interest is in machine learning, machine reasoning, information retrieval, recommender systems, natural language processing, explainable AI, and fairness in AI. He serves as associate editor for ACM Transactions on Information Systems, ACM Transactions on, uh, on Recommender Systems, and Frontiers in Big Data. He's the CBOX Corner and an NSF uh, Career Awardee. Let's welcome Professor Yunfeng Zhang. Okay, thank you, Feng Zhao. Let me share my screen. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay, good, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Fondra, for your introduction. And it's my honor to share uh, some of our thoughts and research on the direction. So uh, my talk today is towards trustworthy recommended systems from shallow model to deep model to large model. Um, so we know that recommended systems are everywhere, right? So they influence our daily life by providing uh, a lot of personalized services. So the technical advancement of recommended system can be very generally, very broadly classified mm -hmm. into three stages, uh, shallow model, deep model, and recently large model. Uh, and there are a lot of representative methods in each category. For example, for shallow models, we have uh, user or atom-based CF or matrix factorization. And uh, for deep models, uh, we have deep and wide neural matrix factorization and a deep matrix factorization. Um, for large models, recently there are the P5 model and the M6 rec model, which tries to use to uh, which tries to use large language models for our recommendation. Later, we are going to introduce the uh, three stages. So I would like to first start with a very general broad view of the AI area, which is the objective AI versus the subjective AI in the area. And I'm going to show that the recommendation system is actually a very unique task in the AI family because it's very close to human beings among all of the AI tasks. And it is a very representative subjective AI task. And because of this, this leads to many unique challenges in the recommended, recommended system research and more broadly in the whole AI research. So for objective AI, we see that uh, objective AI are relatively far from human and the problems in these AI problems, you already have exact answers. For subjective AI, they are very close to human, and the problems usually they do not have absolute answers for the for the problems. Uh, let's use the three very uh, representative AI tasks to to take a closer look, which are computer vision, natural language processing, and the recommender system. So, for example, in computer vision, we have a lot of tasks like uh, image classification, right, image segmentation, and object uh, detection. So, a common uh, 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 characteristic of these tasks is that usually they are going to have uh, uh, definite answers. For example, for this image, right, this is a cat and this is a dog. And for this image, the object there are a lot of, a lot of objects in this image. However, the classification of the image is the same for everybody. For me, this is a cat. For you, it's also a cat, right? It doesn't change according to uh, people's subjective opinions. And that's why we call them as uh, uh, objective AI task. NLP is 
is is sometimes something in between. There uh, is partly objective and partly subjective. There are both some very objective tasks, relatively objective tasks. For example, uh, syntactic analysis of the sentence or uh, word segmentation, and there are a lot of other very uh, object subjective tasks. For example, dialogue system, because it's you can hardly say that uh, this way of conversation is completely right or another way of conversation is completely wrong right? there's is no 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 there's nothing that is completely right or completely wrong it it it, it definitely depends on who you are talking with and uh, what is the preference of the user uh, that you are currently talking talking with uh recommender system on the other hand is a very typical subjective ai task for example in movie recommendation or in product recommendation right so we can never, we can seldom see that recommending this movie is absolutely right or another movie is absolutely wrong. There's nothing, you know, absolutely right or wrong. It just depends on whether your recommendation is appropriate, it is suitable for the user. But there's there's no absolute definite answer for the recommendation. So later we're going to show that because of the subjective nature of the recommender recommended system task. Uh, trustworthiness and the responsible research becomes very important in this particular uh, research area. <clears throat> For example, subjective AI needs explainability. The reason is because that uh, because there is no definite answer for the for the problems. Sometimes it's very difficult for human beings to identify if the recommendations is good or not for me. For example, in objective AI tasks like uh, image uh, classification, right? If our AI system misclassify an image, then human beings can directly know that your classification result is wrong. So you don't have to explain. So everything is clear to, to, a, to a reasonable human being. However, in the subjective AI tasks, if we recommend something, human beings can hardly identify if the AI produced recommendation result is right or wrong, because there is no definite right or wrong. It's highly personalized and subjective. So in many cases, uh, we can. It doesn't matter what you recommend, but actually, how do you explain your recommendation to to human users? So let we can consider how we human beings uh, recommend things to each other. So usually, we are going to justify our recommendation with an explanation. For example, I recommend this movie because of something, because of the director, because of the plot, or because of the actor, something like that. So if we recommend without any uh, explanation. Sometimes it can make other people difficult to understand, and sometimes it's even uh, offensive to recommend without any explanation. So subjective AI also needs fairness. The reason is because just because users cannot easily identify if something is right or wrong, and because of this, users are very vulnerable because users could be manipulated utilized or even sometimes cheated by the system because users can hardly identify if something is right or wrong like uh, other uh, objective AI tasks. And because of this, subjective AI really needs uh, fairness. And it also, because of this subjective nature, it also leads to other some other problems, for example, echo chamber. And it's also because of the uh, 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 subjective nature, <clears throat> nature, because users don't know which recommendations are right or which are wrong. They have to click. And the lack of explanation makes the problem even worse because the more you click about something, the more the recommended system will recommend similar things. And then uh, you're going to like it even more. Finally, you're going to trapped into an echo chamber or feedback loop. And uh, this leads to a further problem, which is controllability. I think this is a very important problem in al almost all of the current recommender system because users almost have no control of the recommender system. They have to, they, ha they can only passively receive the recommendations. And this is actually a horrible problem in the AI development because it's related to what kind of AI that we want in the future. So we definitely hope that in the future, AI uh, humans can control AI rather than AI controls human, right? rather than humans being controlled by AI. That would be a horrible future uh, for the AI development. 
So we're going to uh, talk about uh, controllability in AI research. In general, all of this leads to the importance of, uh, <clears throat> of trustworthiness and the responsiveness in uh, recommended system research more broadly in subjective uh, AI research. For example, the explainability, fairness, echo chambers, and the controllability. And there are even many more other perspectives, for example, the robustness, accountability, and the privacy of the uh, subjective AI uh, systems. And uh, <clears throat> because recommended system is a very representative uh, human-centered AI task, it naturally involves human in the loop, and it is a very representative subjective, subjective AI task. So recommended system has been leading the trustworthiness and the responsible AI research in the uh, community. An example is the uh, resume ranking and the recommendation problem, which I, I hope to use this example to highlight the importance of uh, uh, explainability uh, and fairness in general in this kind of uh, subjective AI tasks. The background is that many companies are using automated tools, for example, LinkedIn uh, for recruiting. <clears throat> LinkedIn has an interface for, uh, for recruiters so when a job is posted, usually you are going to receive as a recruiter, as an HR, you possibly may receive thousands of applicants. And it's very difficult to manually screen every, you know, every candidate's resume to make a final, uh, final ranking. So the solution is to use some machine learning models to rank the candidates, which basically are recommendation models because they ranks the candidates based on uh, NLP anal analyzation over the user's profile, for example. And then only the top candidates, for example, the top 10 candidates can uh, maybe, are, their resume are going to be manually exam exam examined and they are going to have the uh, interview, uh, a chance of interview. So here's the problem from the recruiter's perspective. Definitely, I want to know why this candidate is ranked higher than another candidate because, because I want to know why this candidate is a better fit than another for my job. And uh, from the applicant's perspective, they also demand explanation because they want to know why should I trust this algorithm, right? And why should my whole career be decided by a machine, by, a, by an algorithm rather than by a human being? So to answer all of these kind of why questions, we need, uh, we need explainable AI. So in general, in these kind of systems, we not only want to guarantee that, <clears throat> that a model actually works with uh, high accuracy, but also we want to make sure we understand why it works. <clears throat> For example, why the model makes a particular decision, why it is fair, and why can we trust this decision? Because we hope that in the future, humans can control AI rather than AI controls human. And this is even more important in what we call as high stake applications that are related to humans' health, safety, and the law. For example, in healthcare recommendation, financial recommendation, and the legal assistance because uh, in these systems, we hope the AI system can be responsible and trustworthy, which can uh, help, help us to make better uh, decisions. So uh, in the following parts, I'm gonna to, uh, introduce some of the, I think, uh, uh, important and uh, representative techniques to as, 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 as uh, 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 responses to the uh, uh, previous problems. <clears throat> including uh, explainability, fairness, controllability, and the echo chamber. So in particular, uh, one example is counterfactual explanation. So basically, it can tell us, uh, explain why something is recommended by telling us that, uh, <clears throat> for example, if an atom had been slightly worse on a particular feature, a particular aspect, then the system would not have recommended this uh, atom. So this is different from traditional association-based explanation because in a traditional association-based explanation, we just calculated the matching score between the atom's performance and the user's preference to make the uh, extract of the explanation. However, counterfactual reasoning tries to, for example, find a feature and slightly decrease the score of the feature from uh, 3 to 2.1. So if after a slight change in this feature's score, then this product will never be recommended, then we can call that this feature is a good explanation because 
if this feature is is slightly worse, then we would not have recommended this product as before. It will be kicked out from the recommend, top two recommendation list. So uh, a very important uh, uh, property of explanation is that we hope the explanation to be both effective and simple according to the OCAMS Razor principle, uh, just like uh, uh, other AI research, machine learning research. So we can uh, use some mathematical notations to represent the uh, complexity and the strength of an explanation. For example, the complexity can be represented by the number of aspects that you need to generate explanation and the degree of changes on the features in the final explanation. So the explanation strength can be characterized by the, 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 the difference of the recommendation score before and after you apply the changes on the features. So one thing to emphasize here is that the complexity and the strength of the explanation are two orthogonal concepts because uh, complex ex explanations may not be strong and the simple explanations may not be weak. So actually there could be complex but weak explanations and there could also be simple and strong explanations so first, among the, those different types of explanations, we first want to guarantee that the explanation is strong, which, which means that the explanation is effective, which means that the, uh, based on this explanation, the atom can really be kicked out from the recommendation, uh, recommendation list. So if two explanations are both strong, we prefer the simple one because we want to, the explanation to be cognitively easy to understand for human beings. And this can be formulated into the uh, uh, constraint optimization framework. We minimize the explanation complexity and we <clears throat> constraint on the explanation is strong enough. Based on our definition of uh, uh, complexity and strength, we can easily formulate this into a uh, optimization problem. So another important thing is that uh, counterfactual explanation is very easy for evaluation. So evaluation is a very important mm -hmm. problem in explainable AI research because usually we do not have ground truth explanation. So it's gonna be very difficult to evaluate the explanations. But the counterfactual mm -hmm. explanation can be easily evaluated even if there's no ground truth. We can use the uh, sufficiency and the necessity to evaluate the explanations. So <clears throat> we can say that uh, uh, an explanation is necessary if that a a feature, after a feature is removed, mm -hmm. then the product will no longer be recommended. Then we see that this explanation is necessary because without this explanation, mm -hmm. the product cannot be recommended. So if we only need the explanation to recommend a product, then we see that this, mm -hmm. this explanation is sufficient because we only need this one feature to recommend uh, the atom. And uh, we can first say that uh, we can generate a better explanation uh, quality mm -hmm. on those uh, on those uh, uh, evaluation metrics. And the uh, important uh, interesting observation is that uh, 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 for those top top ranked atoms, for example, atom at the top position, usually the corresponding explanation have higher strength and the complexity. So this is also uh, uh, intuitive because if we if something is is re recommended in the top position, it means that the system strongly recommends something. To strongly recommend something, it has to be backed with a strong explanation. So the explanation is a little bit more complex and uh, strong stronger. Okay. So <clears throat> uh, counterfactual explanation can also be used to improve the controllability. For example, uh, we can provide those kind of counterfactual retrospective explanation and a counterfactual prospective explanation. For example, if a video is recommended, for example, in, in, in Douyin or in TikTok, so we can see that we recommend this video because you previously liked some other videos like A and B. And if you didn't like them, then we would not have recommended this video X. So if user know this reason, then the user can, uh, for example, cancel the red heart on the videos A and B before, then the video will not be recommended. So by doing this, we can provide the users a way to control the past. Also, we can provide the counterfactual prospective explanations. For example, we can tell user, if you like this video X, then we're going to in 
recommend some other videos D and E in the future. Otherwise, we're not going to recommend these kind of videos. So if a user knows this, then the user, if user really likes D and E, then the user can click right heart on video X, then in the future, D and E will really be recommended. So by doing this, we can help user to control the future of the recommended system. So basically by helping users to know the consequence of their behaviors based on the counterfactual explanations, we can help users to control their recommendation in a more fine-grained way by invoking or revoking uh, some, uh, some actions in the system. Uh, so we can also bridge explainability and the fairness uh, because the counterfactual explana <coughs> explanation is a very flexible framework. As long as we're able to quantify the explanation target, we'll be able to uh, explain uh, the target. <clears throat> and explainable fairness actually is very important in recommended system because there are already hundreds or even thousands or even more features in the recommended system. And it's very difficult for system designers to manually examine uh, these yeah. kind of features to uh, to understand why uh, <clears throat> the model is fair or unfair. For example, these are the top five features in the uh, in the Yelp data set, which leads to uh, exposure and fairness. And we can see that it's without some uh, explainable fairness tools, it's very difficult for human designers to to, to, to understand why these features lead to unfairness. Right? So uh, we can similarly uh, 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 conduct uh, counterfactual reasoning. For example, we try to minimize the counter explanation complexity uh, under the constraint that the model unfairness should be smaller or equal than some threshold. So we can f flexibly define our uh, fairness requirement. For example, we can use equal opportunity fairness uh, in here. It could be other definitions based on what we want. So by doing so, we can achieve a better trade-off between fairness and utility, for example, like uh, this line, which means that <clears throat> whenever we, we achieve the same recommendation accuracy, our fairness is better. And when, whenever we achieve the same fairness as in the baseline, our recommendation accuracy is also better than the baseline. So finally, uh, another type of explanation that we think is important is natural language explanation because uh, it is a very natural, mm -hmm. flexible way to for, for machines to interact with human beings. <clears throat> and the recommended system is a very suitable task uh, to explore natural language explanation because we have ground truth sentences where users explain in their reviews why they uh, uh, purchased something and why they like it or why they dislike it. So a recent advancement on natural language explanation is large recommendation models for uh, recommendation uh, for, for, for explainable recommendation. Actually, it's not only applicable for explainable recommendation, but more generally for a lot of other recommendation tasks. For example, sequential recommendation, uh, rating prediction, uh, explanation generation, review summarization, and a direct recommendation. So we can build one large recommendation model that can process all of these recommendation tasks using one model so that we can achieve a universal recommendation engine. The idea is to define uh, personalized prompts which can translate each task into a natural language query so that we can uh, use language models to, uh, to, to answer this query. <clears throat> uh, for example, we can formulate the rating prediction task using a sentence, what star rating do you think this user will give to this atom? So we can simply ask a question like this and our language model can, uh, can, can derive the answer for this question and uh, produce a score. For example, it's, it's a five star score for this user and this atom. So we can use this to, to solve all the mm -hmm. tasks like a, a, a sequential recommendation all the way to direct the recommendation. So uh, uh, we can achieve better recommendation accuracy, and more importantly, the explanation quality can be further improved compared to some previous natural language explanation task uh, models. <clears throat> and then it can also improve the uh, zero-shot generalization performance to new domains, which enables good performance on code start recommendation scenario.
So as a quick summary, right? So in this talk, we emphasized the importance of trustworthiness and the responsibility in recommended system research, including the, uh, for example, explainability, fairness, echo chambers, and controllability. Uh, of recommended systems. And uh, uh, so just to as a reminder, there are also some other uh, many perspectives, for example, robustness, accountability, and privacy, which are also very important for trustworthiness uh, research in recommendation. And we compare the different recommendation tasks in terms of the objectiveness and the subjectiveness in the AI domain to highlight the unique role of recommended system in the AI uh, research area. Uh, so that we hope that uh, this direction can contribute more and uh, to the to the to the trustworthiness AI research and to make more contributions. Uh, thank you. So if there's any question, I'm, I'm happy to uh, interact and answer. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Zhang, uh, for your uh, wonderful um, talk on responsible and trustworthy recommended system. Uh, do our audience have some questions? Yeah. Uh, Jiwei, yeah, please. Um, uh, hi, Professor Zhang. I'm Hello. currently, I'm Jiwei Yi, and I'm currently uh, an intern at SC Group. And uh, uh, thanks for your impressive talk, and I have learned a lot from your talk. And uh, as your as you mentioned in your slides, uh, you compute the score difference after you removing a feature to measure the uh, uh, to measure the, the uh, to give a explanation for the recommendation results. However, yeah. the currently the recommendation models are uh, designed more complexity uh, more complex than before, and the models. Uh, are designed to modeling the interactions between uh, the the features. So I think most uh, uh, likely the the models may not uh, uh, recommendation uh, uh, due to a single feature. So uh, can your methods uh, give a more complex uh, explanation on several features or uh, the methods you uh, you you introduce? After the POM, the large model-based methods can give a more complex explanation. Mm. Yeah, thank you for your question. So I think this is a very good question. So um, uh, one thing is that uh, usually, uh, no matter it's shallow model or deep model or large model, eventually the recommendation list is generated by some kind of scores. Um, so in matching model and uh, sorry in shallow and deep model, you already were going to use some kind of matching mechanism right to generate the score. Uh, for example, a matching network, given a user and given an atom, we're going to calculate the score. Uh, for these kind of models, of course, we can we can we can directly calculate the difference before and after we make some changes. Um, but even for the large models, even usually the large models are mm -hmm. generative models. They directly generate the re recommendation list or the recommended atom. But even for those kind of uh, generative models, they are still actually based on the scores. For example, when we are trying to generate an atom ID or a sentence, usually we're going to do beam search, right? So in the beam search process, we're going to you know, calculate some kind of softmax probability to decide which token to generate in the next stage. So usually this, this softmax probability can be considered as the matching score in the uh, recommendation list the generation process, and that score can be used to uh, calculate the difference before and after we make some change. Um, so uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, counterfactual explanation, maybe, um, so, in my opinion, so I could be wrong, but uh, but in my opinion, that uh, I think counterfactual explanation is actually very suitable for explaining uh, huge models, large language models, for example, <clears throat> because we in those kind of explanations we do not change the model itself, right? We only change the input. So when the when the model becomes very large, it's very difficult for us to make changes on the model because that will be you have to retrain the model, which takes a lot of computational time, but it's very easy for us to change the input. So we can just change the input and see how the output changes. 
then this can help us to extract the uh, counterfactual explanations. So I think this is actually an advantage of uh, counterfactual explanation in terms of explaining these uh, these these uh, big models, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We have another question from uh, Jie Xun. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Fan Zhao, and thanks, Professor Yongfeng. I have a question for P5. Uh, so okay. what's the motivation and benefit for the unified recommended system? Will this yeah. multitask framework sacrifice the performance uh, compared with a dedicated model trends towards a specific task? Um, actually, uh, there are several, perspect several um, uh, advantages that we think are important. First, actually, the different tasks benefit each other because they can trans translate the information from each other. Uh, according to our experiment, actually, the tasks can benefit from each other and they uh, improve the recommendation performance. Uh, another thing we think is that the uh, unique advantage of large model is the ability to do multimodality learning. So in the in previous in the previous years of recommended system, actually in a lot of commercial recommendation engines, most of the most of the recommendation system are still based on uh, user clicks or user, for example, those kind of uh, 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 user behaviors. This is very important, very good, uh, but uh, the multimodality information has not been well modeled in previous uh, methods. Um, for example, in uh, video recommendation or in like uh, uh, short video recommendation or news recommendation, uh, maybe news recommendation is, is already modeling the text. Um, um, yeah, and the social image recommendation, for example. So uh, the reason is not because those information are not important, they are important. But in previous models, we have to design very different models for, very, for, for, for different types of information. For example, to process image information, you have to design unique models to, to process image. To design uh, uh, text-based recommendation models, you have to design unique models for text recommendation. So that makes, um, that results in hundreds or even thousands of different small and different models, which makes it very difficult for uh, industry practi practitioners to, to, to maintain uh, so many models. So uh, the unique advantage of a uh, large model is that uh, we can just use one model to process many, many different kinds of modality information You're using the using the same way, for example, image, text, uh, user behavior, audio, right, or even video in the future. All of this information can, can be can be can be processed uh, just based on a sequence of tokens using one model. And uh, uh, that can eventually help to uh, 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 to make the recommended system more comprehensive, and uh, um, you know both uh, improve the performance, but more importantly, to enable a lot of uh, functions that are unimaginable before. For example, maybe users can directly not only receive the recommendations, but maybe they are able to directly edit the recommendations. Um, by directly I mean, talking with the uh, the recommended system using natural language to control the recommended system using natural language, and uh, uh, that enables more uh, 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 natural interaction between users and the recommended systems. So that's my thoughts. Yeah, and I, if there are, are any other thoughts, I'm happy to uh, to, to to discuss. discuss yeah. yeah, got it. Thanks for the detailed comments. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhang. Yeah, yeah, Professor Zhang's talk is very attractive, and we have many uh, questions from the audience. Uh, but uh, due to a uh, uh, time limit, we will have uh, the uh, last uh, question. Um, uh, Bing Zhu, uh, you, you can ask. Oh, OK, thanks. Uh, I'm Bing Zhu from Microsoft Research Asia. I have, okay. in fact, yeah. two questions here. One question is that your contextual letter approach it seems very similar to LIME uh, analysis, that approach, basically by changing some part of the input, and you see the score changes right there to determine which part is important, which part is not. And uh, basically, can you comment the difference between two methods? That's the first question. The second question is here. 
even you do this kind of analysis, sometimes it's still hard to make sense that you change something, the score changes a lot, but it's still hard for him to understand uh, why you have such a big change. But in this case, how to deal with it? Okay, yeah. those are my two questions. Yeah, okay, Thanks. thank you for a question. Yeah, thank you. So uh, for the first question, the difference with Lime. So first, uh, I do agree that uh, they are very similar. The idea is to identify some features that it can uh, that leads to the uh, score. So the difference, I think, are, are two. One is the uh, Lime, it tends to be a local, uh, 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 you know, local explanation based on local approximation, local linear approximation of the uh, original uh, design function. But uh, counterfactual explanation can be global. It means that uh, you know, we do not approximate the model. We just to say how does the, you know, what's the triggering features that results in a particular, uh, uh, you know, particular output. Uh, so I think that this is the, uh, Relationship and difference with 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 Lime. Uh, another uh, yeah, this is one difference: global versus local. Another difference is the change. So based on my understanding, uh, Lime tends to uh, the optimization goal of Lime is to achieve the same regression score using a simple linear model as the original score from the original model. Uh, but we do not care too much about how the score changes according to some features or some input, uh, something like that. Uh, so uh, yeah, so I think the basic these are two uh, differences from the uh, from the line model. Uh, for the second question, sorry, I forgot the second question. What what is the second question again? The second question here, basically, at least for uh, work on Lime analysis, we found out that uh, some changes right there, you can see that there is a big change in the score, but still it's hard for him to understand why there's such a big change. And in this case, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. how deal with how to uh, deal right, with yeah. it? Right, right. Yeah, this is a very fundamental pro question, I think. So, uh, it all attributes to our first. I, I would agree with you that uh, for those kind of uh, counterfactual explanation is a one is a type of uh, post hoc explanation. Basically, we are not opening the black box. We are still consider, considering it as a black box. We're just trying to understand how does the input, how does the output changes corresponding to the input. For the for the black box, but uh, maybe we are not really understanding the black box. So, but the question is that uh, if the explanation is uh, trustworthy, for example, is it's trustable for human beings, so it can be useful even if we do not open the black box. For example, in counterfactual explanation, right? So, um, uh, if we tell the user that uh, if uh, the feature didn't exist, then we are not going to recommend the this product. Then user can totally trust this explanation because we have already executed this explanation over the black box model, and it really is what we are seeing, right? So, if, which means that if the user didn't interact with, in our example, with with video A and B, we are really not going to uh, recommend. Uh, video X. So because of these users can totally trust and believe our explanation, even though it is still a post hoc explanation. And uh, that's why the uh, counterfactual explanation is still useful in the in practice. Yeah. But I do agree, agree with you that, uh, you know, um, counterfactual explanation or more generally post hoc explanation, you know, they are not trying to open the black box. They are still post hoc explanations, but just because they are useful. So we tend to use them uh, in practice. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Zhang, uh, for giving us a uh, great talk uh, to the deep night of America. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah.